Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today I want to kick the tires of the preview implementation of the latest Go Generics Design Draft. This new design draft came out during the past week and is the first update in about a year. Do make sure to take a look at the new design draft document. Lots of interesting information in here about what they included and what they didn't, as well as comparison to other languages. As for my demo program, I'm going to go back and look at a previous program I wrote some while ago for a previous video. I included C++20, Rust, and Zig. And in each, I implemented a generic norm or vector length function, and then wrote a customized version for two-dimensional float32 points, with the hope of seeing that there wouldn't be much difference between explicit simple calculations and the abstracted version. So here we see the C++ output assembly, which mostly just squares, adds, and square roots the parameters. In Rust, we see the same. And in Zig, the same as well, though perhaps even shorter. Slightly different things are happening in each of these outputs. But in all cases, they optimize away the abstraction. Let's see what the new Go Generics preview implementation does. And worth pointing out that they don't claim this is how it's going to be implemented in the end. What they currently have is a source to source translator that translates from hypothetical go to to ordinary go. And they call it go to go. And the intention is that if they do implement generics, maybe in a year, then it will be supported natively inside the compiler, not implemented as a source to source translation. There might be other differences in the implementation or the design by that point as well. So caveats aside, let's look at this. So in the current design for go generics, for primitive types, you don't directly say what kinds of operations should be available. Instead, you just say, I want to have a new generic interface type which is any of these types. And so these are all the types that I could automatically convert to and from float64, and so I bundled them together here. Then I have a generic interface where the scalar has to be of some kind of type that can convert to or from float. Then I can implement this interface via custom types, such as the struct here that can make a vector out of a slice of any kind of floatable. And the reason I did this instead of using, say, a slice directly is because there's no way to do operator overloading on your custom types. So if you want to have something that can work for slices or for other types, you have to define your own interface methods. As for a potentially more performant implementation of this generic vector interface, I've also created a point to struct. And this is what I did approximately in the other languages as well. And then I say, if you're asking for index zero, you get the X. If you ask for index one, you get the Y. And the length is always two. And then I implemented the generic norm operation twice. And I did this because I wanted to see the effects on the performance. In one case, I made a generic function that's generic only on the type of scalar. And in the other case, I made a generic function that also includes the type of vector as one of its type parameters. The bodies of these functions are exactly the same. And then I made a number of convenience functions that call my generic versions for either slices of float64 or for points of float32. And then also for comparison with old style Go, I created a norm any that works on interfaces instead of actual scalar types. To see this implementation, let's go to the top, which I hit at first because it's painful. So the any vec, instead of having a particular scalar type inside of it, instead returns arbitrary types. And I made a custom struct for this that I could do implementations on that will return any's rather than particular types. And here's norm any, which is approximately like before, only inside of here, I have a case switch statement in order to get the correct type out. And I'm always going to return a float 64 because it's hard to know what you should be converting it to in the end anyway. And so down here in my convenience functions, I also have a norm 2f any that acts the same as my norm 2f, except that it goes through norm any instead of through a generic version of norm. And then in the main function, I just call all my convenience functions. Let's see what happens here. Note here I'm calling go tool go to go run, and then my go to program. In order to get go to go, I had to check out the correct branch from the git repository and then compile that branch. It wasn't too painful. Not all the unit tests passed, but it got the job done. We see here if we try to find the vector length of vectors one, two, three, three dimensional vector, we get the same result whether we go through the interface version of the vector or through an explicit version of the vector. 
And for the length of our two-dimensional vectors, again, whether going through the vector interface, an explicit type, or hard-coded simple implementation, or going through the any interface scalar, we have the same result. And instead of running it, we can also do the translation. And then look at what it creates. Here are our convenience functions. In the case with the generic interface, we still get particular instantiations of our float vec, but we're calling different instantiations of the function in either case. Same thing applies to our point twos. And here's our simple one that we expect to be simple. Here also is our go one, any interface scalar type. Let's look at this instantiated vector type first. If we compare this, what we had in our go to source, we see that our struct was generic. In this case, we get a particular version of our struct that's specific to float 64. This is called monomorphization, and it also contrasts with, the, say, the erasure you get in Java generics. What we see in many other languages, including the examples of C++, Rust, and Zig, is that we get specific implementations for specific types. And here's getting out a float 64, for example, from our float 64 slice vec. And here are various auto-generated monomorphized versions. Monomorphized meaning it only supports the one specific type. Monomorphized versions of our norm functions, either for the generic VEC interface or for a specific VEC type. And the same holds for the point two versions down here. Now, personally, I'd have liked to have been able to say that this should auto be able to optimize to the same thing as this during the compiler processing. I don't know if this is an issue of optimizations they didn't implement, or if this is a case of they want to make sure the semantics are clear, such that if you don't say I want a specific parameterized type, you ought to get the interface. So I'm not sure this is about semantics or implementation at this point. Further, it would have been nice if I had been able to say, leave this off and let it be inferred. We find that at least for the current implementation, they're not very happy with that. If I take off these, it explicitly says it can't infer the scalar type. So well, maybe it can infer the vector type if it can't infer the scalar type, right? Nope. If I'm going to give it explicit type arguments, it wants them all. And I haven't read carefully enough again to know whether this is by design or whether it's just the current implementation isn't as fancy as it could be. Anyway, once we have it converted to Go1, we can use other Go tools on top of this. So for example, we can generate assembly out of this. We can look for our norm2f code here. And I'm not sure whether Go ever intends to uh, do further optimizations past this stage, but at least at the current stage we see, for example, that just like what we thought we saw with norm2f calling a separate norm function, we see this inside of the assembly code as well. And the only case we get of seeing something that looks very optimized is for the case where we explicitly used the simple direct implementation. Or in other words, we're not going to be getting these quote unquote zero cost abstractions in Go at the current stage. And that's not terribly surprising. Go is known for being a fast compiler, not the most optimizing compiler. I'm just kicking the tires here to see what to expect at the current stage, which again may change in the future for a variety of reasons. But if we are interested in perhaps in execution speed at the moment, just for entertainment's sake, might as well do some benchmarking. And Go has convenient benchmarking built in, although these functions were all fast enough that I still put a loop of a million inside of each of these functions. But I'm going to benchmark each of these convenience operations that we defined and called here. Let's see how they go. And first, I need to remove my assembly, otherwise it tries to compile it in. Then it can run the benchmark. Only it's going to look way better if we reformat to get them all in simple columns. So we see here, these are our two n-dimensional slice vec versions, in this case using three-dimensional vectors. 
and we see that when going through the interface, it is slower than when we have the extra customized version. And that holds the same for the point two implementation as well. Here's one that's the generic interface, and here's the one that's specifically for point two. And we see that, again, we get an order of magnitude speed up. Now, what's interesting to me is that for the versions on specific vector types, the slice version actually seems maybe to go faster than the point two version, which somewhat surprises me. Might have to do with whatever kind of optimizations actually do exist inside of the Go compiler. Although in the generic vector interface type, the point two goes faster. And the simple implementation that goes directly to the 2D math is another order of magnitude faster than either of those. Then finally, this one that goes through where even the scalar itself is of an any interface. Remember that's this one up here, whose implementation requires a type switch, is faster than the interface vector version of the explicit scalar type, but slower than the point two interface version. And this surprises me as well. I really would have expected this to be slower than either of the ones above. Haven't dug deep into exactly why. In any case, this exercise was fun for me to see what I could do with my code in terms of making it generic. And it's definitely nice not to have to do things like this. And it was also fun to see a little bit of what does the execution speed look like, even though that's not necessarily the focus here. Anyway, since Go is such a popular language, I hope whatever they work out is for everyone's benefit. Maybe we can look at it again in the future. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Go tool, go to go, go to y'all.